Vast and mysterious, the oceans cover three quarters of the Earth's surface. Life began here, and it's sustained here. The oceans are the vital force of the planet, yet we know little else about them. Perhaps learning about one of its oldest living creatures, the rare leatherback sea turtle, could help unlock some of the mysteries held by these waters before she vanishes forever. I am very glad to welcome the wildlife lovers to Trinidad. And musically, I'll give you these facts. You came here to observe the letterbacks. And the facts now I must unfold. One of the best species in the world. Near the equator, where the Caribbean gives way to South America, sits the twin island country of Trinidad and Tobago. What few people know is that Trinidad is a ruggedly tropical country, more South American than Caribbean with a rainy season that lasts eight months. And each year, from March to September, Trinidad's east and north coast beaches are home to some of the world's largest nesting sites for the oldest, largest, and furthest roaming of all sea turtles, the leatherback. Eight times the weight of an average man, and two meters or more in length, with a flipper span nearly as long, the leatherback is always on the move, gliding through the water at a constant rate of over three kilometers an hour. Nicknamed the Ancient Mariner, it will spend most of its 80 years at sea, roaming more than 12,000 kilometers around the world each year. Rarely glimpsed at sea, the elusive males are practically never seen. Our only regular encounter with them is when females come to nest on the same tropical beach upon which they were born decades before. But how they navigate home remains one of the great mysteries about this reptile. What we do know is that two of the world's most plentiful nesting beaches for leatherbacks are here, on Trinidad's east and north coasts, Matura and Grand Riviera. Following the leatherback's migration to Trinidad each spring for the past five years is Scott Eckert, a senior marine biologist from San Diego's Hub Sea World Research Institute. He's among a small handful of researchers in the world working on leatherbacks. It's a race against time. Incidental catch and fishing nets around the world are threatening the survival of the species. So Scott's on a journey to the northeast coast of Trinidad to find leatherbacks. He'll be joined by a small team of Canadian and American scientists to continue vital research that may one day help stem the loss of the leatherback. I'm in Trinidad to look at how we might find ways of keeping turtles away from fishing nets. One of the ways in which we are addressing the problem is to look at their hearing. If we can understand what sounds leatherbacks don't like, maybe we can find a way to develop a sonic device that will repel turtles from fishing gear. Traveling through Trinidad's northern rainforest is like moving far back in time, a time when leatherbacks appeared much as they do today. The leatherback is the most ancient of sea turtles. It's over 120 million years old. Indeed, the leatherback was nesting on tropical beaches when there was only one giant continent. It was here when the dinosaurs were here. It's that old. 
Among the many creatures who swam the ancient waters in our Jurassic Park were leatherbacks and other sea turtles. In fact, leatherbacks bear a striking resemblance to Archelon, a sea mammoth who disappeared 70 million years ago. And like leatherbacks must have done so long ago, they will travel far in search of their prime food source, the wondrous iridescent jellyfish. Leatherbacks can consume twice their weight in jellyfish daily, and they have to, since jellyfish are not the most energy-rich nutrient. And these turtles will dive 1,200 or more meters to avoid natural predators like killer whales and sharks. Like all sea turtles, the gentle, shy leatherback is a wonder of adaptation and survival, having lived through the great extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. But the days when leatherbacks nested in the thousands, like these Ridley turtles, are long gone. Each turtle season, the first thing Scott does is check in with the local turtle watchers in villages near the nesting sites. Villages like Matura, some 56 kilometers northeast of Porto, Spain. It's here where an environmental group called Nature Seekers works hard to conserve leatherbacks and to promote ecotourism. No, Key to their work, of course, no, is education. Who can tell me what can it do? A leatherback turtle. And why do they call it a leatherback turtle? Right, because it has a leathery texture. Now, why do we protect turtles? Right, because they're endangered, right? What made them endangered? Who can tell me? What happens in the ocean with nets? Right, they are caught, they are drowned in nets. Because when the net tangles them up, they cannot come up to breed. Good to see you. Yeah, see. If nets are the problem, then Scott wants to see it firsthand. And the fishing village of Matlot is the perfect place to start. It's literally the end of Trinidad's one road up here. Because this coast sits in the middle of prime leatherback nesting territory, it's one of the places where leatherbacks get caught and often drown in fishing nets. Do you get turtles in the nets very often like that? Yeah, very often, from January month. Fisherman Dave Banner has been fishing here for years, so he knows directly about the problem. For each day that you go fishing, how many of those Okay, every night you get some, then we hold five, some, then we hold six, you know? Five or six turtles? Yeah, yeah, per night. Yeah. Per night? Yeah. Over the whole season, from March all the way through? Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. How many of them do you suppose drown? Well, it all depends. We sometimes one drown, in a sense, and then two drown, yeah. and we free up the rest. So you figure one or two? Yes. Yeah. One or two doesn't sound like much, but multiply that per night, per fisherman, and the number climbs. There may be as many as 500 leatherbacks butchered or drowned in nets each season. Leatherbacks are challenged by a number of things. They're challenged by egg take on the beach or the killing of adult females when they come to nest on the beach. They're killed by pollution at sea. But the single most devastating problem that leatherbacks face today is the incidental killing in fishing operations. A recent example of this kind of take has been what we have seen on the coasts of South America in coastal gillnet fisheries in which they've killed between two and 3,000 leatherbacks every year and virtually wiped out the Mexican and Central American populations. Joining Scott's team this year for the first time is John Lean, an animal behaviorist from Newfoundland's Memorial University. John's expertise is marine conservation, so he knows all about the curtain of death faced by leatherbacks. This is a monofilament gillnet, and it's the type that's used throughout the world and it's uh, held up in the water by a float line with things that float like this. And on the other end, there's leads that sink one edge of the net. And this just hangs as a curtain in the water. And the problem for many animals is that they bump into it and it's loose and they start to struggle. And gradually, they're just caught. And uh, this is the hazard these nets pose to animals like leatherback turtles. But what if a sound warning device could be used to frighten turtles away from the nets? This is what the scientists hope their work on hearing will eventually lead to, 
the discovery and use of sounds that might represent danger for leatherbacks. Of course, the development of such a device is a ways off. Scott must wait for the rest of his team to arrive before his work can continue. Meanwhile, he and Dennis Sammy go out with Banner to see if they can catch a rare glimpse of the problem with their own eyes. Fifteen minutes out, and suddenly they come upon something Scott has never before encountered. Indeed, few scientists have, though it's a daily event for fishermen here, an entangled turtle. Okay, this is the uh, turtle caught up in the net. We're uh, circling around. At first, they can't tell if she's alive, but then they see her take a breath. No one knows how long she's been here, so it's a race against time. Everything Scott knows tells him that this turtle is in grave danger of drowning. Leatherbacks don't stay submerged for long. At most, it's 40 minutes. But if she gets more entangled or becomes too tired, she'll surely die. So Scott's got to get in and make sure she's okay. He finds she's in no immediate danger of drowning. This gives him a few precious moments to see up close what effect the entanglement has on this turtle. For years, marine biologists have seen distinctive scar patterns on leatherbacks' faces and bodies. But their origins have been a mystery. Scott can now confirm what many have suspected. The pressure of this near indestructible nylon net on her face and body seems to leave deep impressions, which then scar over for a very long time. Net pressure is now what Scott finds he must relieve, but he can't cut the net completely because he too could get entangled and drowned. Instead, he'll have to wait until he's back on board before they can free her. Done. Put it on the side. Put a hole in the side here. Hold it, 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 hold it. Scott, it was the right front, left front? Left front. Scott now has a unique opportunity. He can tag this turtle. And that's important because tagging is one of the few ways used to track migration patterns and survival rates. Scott uses both a flipper and a special microchip tag that can be read by an electronic scanner. Because of these tags, whoever encounters this turtle throughout her life will know where she came from and that she has had at least one encounter with a fisherman's net. Now, they can cut her free. Do you need a knife? I got a real sharp knife. Wait, 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 don't, don't target. Do it, wait. I'll give you a sharp knife if you want when I got one down there. I was done already. Is she free? Is she free? She's free. Being able to see how a turtle is entangled in a net has been quite an experience for me. For many years, I've seen what I felt was the symptoms of being entangled in nets and fishing gear, and scar patterns and scratches and missing limbs on turtles. But I'd never really had the opportunity to see how those occur and to confirm my worst fears that most of the damage that I see on turtles on nesting beaches is caused by fishing nets. Like the leatherback's face scars, her body can be a kind of map of all that she's survived, in this case, from the blade of a machete. 
This turtle was lucky. You can see it has a large cut in its front right shoulder as well as under its neck. It was clearly entangled in a fisherman's net and the fisherman tried to chop up the turtle with his machete, but somehow this turtle managed to escape and she has come back to nest. The instinct to nest is so strong that even though she has been assaulted in a very brutal manner and almost killed, she still comes back to nest. Exhausted by nesting, her 400 kilogram girth weighing heavily on her lungs, she gains speed with the first wave of ocean. Perhaps she's finished nesting for the year, but will she survive her ocean roaming to nest again? The odds are against her. Leatherback populations have declined from 115,000 to 35,000 in just under 20 years. It is the leatherback's gentle, almost soul, ocean existence which has helped inspire the many creation myths and legends about turtles that have circulated in the world for centuries. For many native cultures, the whole world was Turtle Island. From ancient Babylon to the aboriginal cultures of Australia, all tell stories about the sacred place held by turtles in the sustenance of life. But as colonization swept throughout the world, a more sinister view and use of turtles emerged, one dominated by the relentless harvesting of turtle eggs, meat, and shells for international trade. Indeed, it was a sign of wealth to indulge in delicacies like turtle soup. This wholesale slaughter of turtles has continued throughout our century. Only recently have international treaties banned harvesting throughout the world. Today, the slaughter may have abated, but not all the threats are gone. Leatherbacks are severely challenged by plastics and other things in the sea because they eat them. They think that they're jellyfish floating in the ocean and they may consume them. So what motivates us is that it's a species in trouble. Not only do you have the fascination for studying something that, that is, is so amazing, you also have the added satisfaction of helping save something, of something that needs our input and needs our help and needs our protection. It's a short drive from Matlock back to Scott's research base at Grand Riviere. The U.S. members of his team haven't arrived yet, so he takes some time to catch up with one of his closest colleagues here, turtle expert and Nature Seekers co-founder Solomon Aguilera. They're both excited. A new tagging program has begun. I know we're excited, ready to see result. We yeah. want to see. Yeah, the first turtle out from the tagging ought to be back any day now. It's going to be cool. <laughs> but what, what, Those guys are going to be walking that far off the ground yes, when they get their yes. first one back. Yeah. When Solomon got started 10 years ago on this stuff, the turtles were being slaughtered out there. Every, every night there were dead turtles on that beach. And they got started and said they wanted to protect them more because they were, they were, they were part of their culture, part of their heritage. When we did the training program for the tagging the other day, the Village of Fishing Pond set representatives up, sent people to be trained by NSI on how to tag and how to learn to tag. The folks at Grand Rivera will do the same thing in the future. And so these guys have the experience, and that's the one thing they really have going for them. More than any other group, more than any other organization, they have the experience, they have the reputation. They're very good at doing the science, they're very good at doing the interpretation. And I think a lot of other groups can learn from that. It's, it's what keeps bringing me back every year because I can come to Solomon and, and this guy can teach me more about how to work with turtles and villagers and local issues than any place I've ever worked in the world. I saw a television interview where turtles were slaughtered in Matura Beach and this is what really triggered me. So I decided I have to change it. It seemed for years nobody had been changing, nobody had been doing anything. And this was a challenge. This was going to make something different to me, not for um, 
fame or fortune, but it was just going to satisfy me personally that I did my part. Scott and John Lane are now joined by the Hub Sea World team. Scott's principal colleague is Dr. Anne Bowles. She's a bioacoustician, a scientist who researches the hearing sensitivity of marine animals and the environmental impact of sound on their survival. After dinner, they'll have a long night of research ahead of them, beginning with a 90-minute drive from their base camp at Grand Riviere to the leatherback nesting beach at Matura. Matura Beach is a rugged and blustery seven-kilometer stretch along Trinidad's northeastern coastline. It's not raining yet, so the tourists are out, anxious to see their first leatherback. We welcome you to our turtle nesting site, and we thank you all for choosing Matura for your turtle viewing recreation. Our group was formed in 1990, Nature Seekers Incorporated. It's the time when Nature Seekers' troop of guides and volunteers go into action. Leatherbacks are extremely sensitive to light, so they will only come ashore to nest when it's dark. Captured by a special infrared camera is the rare sight of leatherbacks close together. They've come to nest near midnight, prime turtle time. By night's end, some 35 or more turtles will have nested on this beach. Once egg laying begins, turtles aren't bothered by lights. The first thing she does is to try and select a spot along the beach that is suitable for her to lay. She'll come in and prepare what we call a body pit. Like he's done countless times before on nights like this, Solomon explains the stages of egg laying. When she's through with the body pit, she will start preparing the nest. Leatherbacks usually dig for about 30 minutes before they're ready to lay eggs. Then with the precision of a seasoned artist, a nest hole three feet deep is smoothly sculpted from the sand. But Solomon finds this turtle has a problem. She dig in a hole for the eggs, but what is happening is that the boat fins are damaged. She's not doing a proper excavation. She'll need help, otherwise the hole won't be deep enough and she'll abandon nesting and go back out to sea. In a situation like this, we may have to help. Watch what she's going to do. She's not going to dig it up properly. Watch. She's not going to bring that sand up. The sand didn't reach. Like how she's damaged here, it could take at least about... Leatherback fins are sensitive. She'll know without turning to look when the nest is ready. An eight-month rainy season means that beach erosion and consequent egg loss are real hazards, so her nest must be as deep as possible. Leatherbacks nest every 10 days throughout the season, depositing an average of seven nests, and each time they'll lay about 80 eggs. But unique to leatherbacks is the mysterious laying of 20 to 30 small, non-viable eggs. These eggs dry out and shrink over the season, so scientists speculate that this helps to make room in the nest for the hatchlings when they emerge in two months' time. It only takes 10 to 15 minutes to fill the nest before covering and camouflaging it begins. It's not long before Solomon finds another turtle. This one has had a collision of sorts, and a piece is missing from the left side of her mouth. It's supposed to be closed. It means that at some time here was damaged. So it's supposed to be locked on. Like this part here is supposed to be part of the... Like maybe she bit something and the whole entire front break off. All leatherbacks secrete thick, jelly-like tears from their eyes. It's the release of salt that their bodies have built up but can't process. Two very large salt glands situated, like one is situated here and the other is situated on this side. It secretes all the salt. On her head here, you'll notice that there's this mark. All leatherback turtles have a mark on their head, and they all are of different shape. So it's like everybody have a different fingerprint. It's like a fingerprint. A half a kilometer down the beach from Solomon and the tour group, the scientists arrive hauling 32 kilos of equipment ready to spend the night. The research conditions are far from ideal. Matura is a long and windy beach with no amenities, rain always threatens, and of course there is almost no light. 
but there are good reasons for going to these lengths. We have to work on the leatherback in the field. There's a number of reasons. One is that the species doesn't adapt to captivity very well. They're so used to the open ocean that they'll beat themselves to death on tank walls if they're put into a confined space. This would be certainly easier if we were willing to sacrifice some of these turtles for the sake of our research, but we're not. Compelled to create a lab on the beach, and for the first time before film cameras, the team embarks on research that's at ground zero. No one has done work like this on these turtles before. Scott and Anne are hoping their work will shed light on how sensitive leatherback hearing is, and sensitivity is crucial. Knowing which sound frequency range the turtle is most responsive to could lead to the creation of a sonar alarm on fishing nets, the prime source of leatherback slaughter. Learning about hearing, though, means that the team must work very quickly tonight. They've only got a 10-minute window on each turtle they test. It's the 10 minutes when leatherbacks are so focused on egg laying that they're not responsive or startled by light or touch. You can see, she got a little pink spot. She's a little teeny one. Egg laying has started, so the experiment begins. A painless technique is used to measure the turtle's hearing. First, they insert a hair-fine electrode just under the skin on her head. Then, Anne's assistant, Eric Berg, will generate sounds on his computer and transmit them to the earphones on the turtle's ears. The goal here is to get a signal from the brain, which is no larger than the size of a human thumb. Thank you, darling. You get an artifact? Uh, no, I'm stimulating. Yes! Oh, excellent. They've confirmed this turtle can hear, which means their setup is working and what she's hearing from Eric's computer are a few tone pips of different frequencies. However, I do appear to be getting a frequency falling response. Uh, oh, good, right. outstanding. Still stimulating, 750. To study how leatherbacks hear and what they can hear is quite challenging. It's not the kind of creature that you can put a set of headphones on and ask it to raise its flipper every time it hears a particular sound. So we use a technique that we've borrowed from folks working with human neonatals. They use a method called auditory brainstem response. And basically what they look at is the child's brain's response to sound. Okay, where are you, you shut down? With that one? Give me... In this experiment, a hair fine electrode is placed under the skin into fatty tissue. The needle is coated with topical anesthetic to prevent pain. You can't see a turtle's ears because they're covered by a tympanum. That's where the earphones are placed. Sound then travels from the ear and inner ear to the brain, where an electrical response is triggered. It's this response which gets picked up by the scientist's electrode. The last thing they do is tag the turtle and take some essential measurements. Tonight's results will wait for more detailed analysis, but at least they've confirmed that leatherbacks can hear and are most sensitive to low frequencies. People used to think that reptiles, turtles particularly, were deaf. Our work is beginning to suggest that not only are they not deaf, but they have very good, very sensitive hearing. Well, why? does an animal that's 120 million years old have to have good ears when it doesn't communicate vocally? I believe it's because they need to be able to hear what's going on around them as a means to avoid danger. And avoiding danger is what leatherbacks like her have excelled at for 120 million years. And like they must have done so long ago, she'll go out to sea under the cover of darkness, only to return to this very beach in 10 days' time to lay another nest. The team, meanwhile, must now prepare for the next day's work. They'll attempt, for the first time, what no one has ever done. They'll test the hearing of a newborn hatchling. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. There's these beautiful little creatures out there they'd probably hear just as well as their parents, so why don't we test their hearing?
The team has moved back to Grand Riviere. Scott now needs to find some hatchlings to continue their research. Hatchlings are ideal because there's no time limit as there is with nesting mothers. Scott knows that adult leatherbacks can hear. What he doesn't know is how sensitive their hearing is. If the team can find this out from the hatchlings, they'll have made an important leap forward in using this knowledge to develop ways of keeping leatherbacks safe in the oceans. Late afternoon, amidst nearby predators, Scott spots a nest of hatchlings bubbling up to the surface. These creatures know only one thing, to move quickly to the bright horizon of the ocean. Though 80 hatchlings rush at once, only one female just might survive into adulthood to return to this beach to lay eggs when she matures in 20 years time. Scott and Anne move their sound work to a new level and create another lab on the beach. Testing a hatchling's hearing is pioneering work. It's also painstaking. We have to get an electrical signal from the turtle's brain. And in order to do that, we have to put a hair fine little wire just under the skin. It's the same technique as the adult experiment, except working with a hatchling makes the procedure much more delicate. Currently, we know that leatherbacks can hear, that they seem to hear well at low frequencies, but it's been terribly challenging to work on nesting females with only that little 10-minute window available to us while she's egg-laying. It was actually something of a watershed to realize this year that we could do hatchlings. We never considered doing hatchlings before, and I'm not really sure why, but it makes good sense. They're easier to work with because of their small size. We can handle them. We can actually restrain them and not bother the turtle too much. After all, hatchlings have just come up out of a nest where they've been restrained for, you know, the last week or two. Bursts of sound emitted from Eric's computer surround the baby turtle, cradled in the center of this earphone. Biggest challenge whenever you work with a new animal as you're studying their hearing is to make sure that the signal that you're getting back from the animal is not some kind of an electrical artifact. Um, 60 hertz noise from the electrical system in the building, something like that. The team maintains their scientific composure, but the air is expectant. They're picking up a signal near the hatchling's brain, and they think this tiny creature might be sensitive to different sounds. We need more information on specifically what frequencies they're hearing. Are they sensitive to frequencies that killer whales use to hunt? Is that going to be a viable technique for us to use to keep leatherbacks away from fishing gear? We don't know the answers to those questions yet. They may have begun to understand something about how this baby hears in the open air, but how well will she hear sounds in water, the very place where her hearing will be most needed for survival? This is now what they must begin to uncover. It's the second phase of the experiment. They create a tiny pool and put a huge speaker into it called an underwater transducer. The speaker will emit sound tones to the baby hatchling underwater. Clip it on, the alligator clip. The hatchling is suspended from a pole and gently immersed in water. Um, checking impedances right now. 5, 20, 15, actually better than the last time we did it. They couldn't have hoped for more promising results, but as scientists, they also know that nothing is definite without repeating experiments over and over again. Still, there is a sense here that they're breaking new ground. We're getting a signal back from the animal. Looks beautiful. That's, <laughs> I know, I know. It's, that's, well, that's what we said. 
So I'm excited. Basically what these means is that these guys here very well underwater. This is really neat. The experiment is done, so Scott can now release the unharmed hatchlings. They've succeeded in zeroing in on a sensitivity range more precise than data received from their work on adult turtles. Leatherbacks might be using sound not only to stay away from danger, but also to orient themselves. It's called acoustic navigation, and it could mean that leatherbacks use a highly evolved sense of hearing to swim with enormous accuracy across thousands of ocean kilometers to their tropical nesting beaches. And no one knows how such genius-like navigation really works. Leatherbacks are remarkable animals because they come to Newfoundland and we've had them swimming in icy water. Uh, this cold-blooded reptile swimming in icy water in Newfoundland. And then it comes down here and it's so warm and then feeds on these remarkably small jellyfish. I mean, that's amazing. What a creature, you know, he's kind of my hero. It's the final leg of research. The scientists will now test some of the sound frequencies on an adult turtle in the open water. G11's been deployed. Yesterday, we succeeded in measuring the sensitivity of a sea turtle. We used a little hatchling sea turtle, and we found out that they actually hear very well at fairly low frequency. So today, what we'd like to do is play back some sounds in that range to a turtle, if we can find one out here, and see if we can get a reaction from them. And, uh, John. But finding that turtle is tricky. Ideally, the scientists would like to mount satellite tracking devices on nesting turtles to help locate them at sea. But without the funds yet to do it, the scientists will attempt to find a turtle the old-fashioned way, by sight. And it's a waiting game, one that John is familiar with, having done sound tests on whales. This is the first time I think anyone's ever tried this experiment with turtles. It's a risky experiment because in this kind of sea, we have to find them and then we have to be able to stay with them. And we do have to watch them fairly carefully. Watching them carefully means gauging whether they're reacting to the sound. But that's not the hard part. Got something. About 10.30 out there. Yeah, it looks like there's somebody close to the surface. They've spotted a turtle on the surface, so Eric and Solomon move fast to lower the transducer in the water. It will transmit the sound tones to the turtle. But before Eric can generate any sounds, the turtle swims away. It's a disappointment to be sure, but not unexpected. They'll return in the future, picking up where they left off, hopefully with the funding they need to track turtles with more precision. But the team has succeeded in understanding a bit more accurately what these turtles can hear. Knowledge that could help save turtles from dying in fishing nets. Meanwhile, other threats still linger that science alone cannot fix. What does the future hold for leatherbacks? There are no fixed numbers yet on how many of them are drowned in nets, or ensnared in them, then slaughtered. But research that Scott Eckert and John Lean have done suggests it is likely more than anyone had thought. So there's another, there's another way that turtle, turtles are slaughtered. Who could tell me? With big fishing nets. That's right. They are being slaughtered for meat. OK? They are being slaughtered for meat. And that's one and very important way that turtles die. Nature seekers can be a great model for all conservation efforts all over the world. And uh, the thing about it is that we have been able to convert a few poachers into conservationists. But is poaching a thing of the past? Not apparently on some of Trinidad's least accessible beaches. While out checking nets, the conservationists spot what looks like trouble. The, the turtle came down and went down. Solomon and Len Peters from the Grand Riviere Environmental Trust go ashore to check out Madamas, a tiny beach near the fishing village of Matlot. They find peculiar turtle tracks that indicate a turtle was dragged up the beach and slaughtered nearby. There's something around here. Are you checking? Ironic, are you? 
What would the sign say and the killer to the right underneath it? Their worst fears are confirmed. It's the remains of a sea turtle, a hawksbill sea turtle, known for its beautiful and valuable tortoise shell. I suspect could be poachers. This is fresh. This is like this morning. It's most likely just for eating purposes. But had we not been there, the poachers would also have taken the shell. There are six species of sea turtle in the Caribbean. Over the last 40 or 50 years, well in excess of 300,000 hawksbills were killed and exported from the Caribbean to support the tortoiseshell trade. Even though the international trade in tortoiseshell jewelry has been banned. See now they bury the, 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 the belly, the stomach. This is fresh. This is like a couple hours old. See the eggs? Yes, yes. Eggs. One of the eggs. It's a fresh, shallow grave filled with the turtle's organs and eggs. This is a remote beach. It's not accessible. It's not patrolled. It's, it's not protected. It's, it's the haven for poachers. Nobody's down here to monitor. So they can come down here and actually wait on a turtle. Choose and, and, and select. So they select and they choose a, a hawk's bill. And the thing about it is that we have so little of them. They are losing hawk's bill fast because of the nets catch them very, very easy. They're very easy to be caught by net and then they stay inland. Unlike um, leatherback turtles that would feed out at sea and stay out at these stay inland, so they'll always be caught. <laughs> what are these? I have always loved being fighting for what is going to lose. I believe they are, they are fighting a losing battle. I believe that. It, it is, I am doing this work for years and I believe we're going to lose them. Like I can feel the embryo moving. But maybe not. Especially if scientists like Scott leave the lab to work with new generations of conservationists. You feel moving in there a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one's still alive. That's great. That's going to be one that we can rebury. Yeah, see, here's another dead one. We don't, we can probably... Young man Michael works for the Grand River Environmental Trust protecting this beach and the eggs, and they're going to be moving them to a different section of the beach where this, this nest that was washing out might be able to be preserved. New generations of conservationists like Michael give hope to the possibility that leatherbacks can be helped to overcome intense pressures on their survival. Keeping species away from the edge of extinction also requires scientists like Scott Eckert, who have only just begun to explore the sensory world of leatherbacks, helping to build a more complex portrait of how these animals survive and perish. And perish they do. Thousands of sea turtles may be caught each year in fishing nets, a large number of them leatherbacks. But will science solve the problem before it's too late? The results from our work were encouraging, but we're probably a number of years away from finding an applicable way to keep turtles away from nets using sound. We're on the cutting edge of science right now. We're pushing systems beyond what they're really made to do. The scientists' work on this trip has already led to UN-supported conservation groups in the Caribbean, calling for a ban on gill net fishing during nesting season. And Scott and John Lean are now working together with Trinidad's fishermen to help solve the gill net problem so that this dinosaur in our midst won't have to face again the curtain of death. But that's above the water. Below it, a 10-centimeter hatchling still manages to entrance a veteran scientist going for one last dive before heading back home. Here's an animal that has survived ice ages. It has survived the extinction of most of the flora and fauna on the planet. The things that it has had to do to survive all this time can teach us a tremendous amount about the world's oceans. It's a bit of a cliche, but the oceans are as vast and as unknown as space. That's the most fascinating thing about the ocean is, the, is that there's so much out there that we don't know 
that we don't understand and that even that we can't even imagine.